Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you guys will stand. So you guys are all here this morning with purpose. God has brought you into this house for a reason, and we're going to make sure you guys leave filled with knowledge, with his wisdom, and his grace inside of you this morning. Amen. That empowers you to live a holy life. Amen. So if you guys are ready to receive this morning, let's go ahead and stretch our arms out to the heavens. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you for who you are in this house, Father. We thank you that you are greater in us than is in the world, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we come, Lord Jesus, to get refilled and fueled, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask you to come and take over this service, Lord. We say come and have your way in this house over every heart and over every mind. Father, right now I speak life. Lord Jesus, I speak, Father, where the enemy has told lies that you, Father, come and you take those out, Father, and you restore it with peace, with understanding, Father, right now, Lord Jesus, to every heart, Lord Jesus, right now, Lord. We say, come and have your way in us, Lord. We surrender it all to you this morning, Lord. We surrender it all to you because you are the God of the impossible. You are the way maker, Father, and there's nothing, there's nothing that can stop you. Because you are the great I am, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. We see you guys. Let's praise this morning. Let's put our hands together. And let's declare that he is the God of the impossible. He is the miraculous Father. Jesus, you are the God of the impossible. Come on, every voice lifted.
How many of y'all believe in the God of the impossible? Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Oh, we thank you that you make a way, Jesus. Oh, you do, you do. And I think this song's getting ready to roll. starting to rise and I see a world on the edge of revival yes I do I think it's only a matter of time cause do what only you can do move what only you can move even the impossible is possible for you There's power 
In Jesus' name, oh, there is all darkness defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping you, my God. Come on, tell him with your own words. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping you, my God. Oh, there's nothing, there's nothing. There's nothing stopping you from breaking all the chains. We let go, we say, come and break it all. We surrender then to you, God. Everything that's holding us back, we say come and break it. Come break it, come break it. Hallelujah. Cause I hear those chains falling. Hallelujah. I hear those chains falling. Oh, the chains of fear, yes. I hear those chains falling. Oh, can you hear them? Because I hear the chains falling. Hallelujah. Because I hear those chains falling. Give it to him, he'll break it down. I hear those chains falling. Yes, we do, yes, we do. Cause I hear those chains falling. Oh, the breaking, breaking. I hear those chains falling. Oh, the chains of legalism. I hear those chains falling. Oh, the chains of religion breaking. I hear those chains falling. Oh, putting God in a box. I hear it. I hear those chains falling. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. I hear those chains falling. Because do what only you can do. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Cause you can make the chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Cause even the impossible it's possible for you. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, Nothing, nothing, Jesus. Come on, let's declare nothing is impossible. And nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you cause you hold my world in your hands nothing is impossible for you nothing is impossible nothing 
I need you, Lord. 
more. Let's sing that again. Cause I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words could say, I need you more. Than ever before, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord, more than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than the next heartbeat, more than anything, and Lord, as time goes by. I will be by your side Cause I never want to go back to my old life Cause I need you more More than yesterday I need you more More than words could say I need you Than ever before, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than the next heartbeat, more than anything, and Lord, as time. I will be by your side Cause I never want to go back To my old life Cause I need you more More than yesterday I need you more More than words can say Father, we do need you this morning. We need you more than anyone else, more than anything else. Lord, we need your healing power to flow into our bodies, into our minds, into our hearts, into our souls, into our spirits. Oh God, we need your healing touch, 
to touch us physically. Lord, there are those who are sick in body. And Lord, we just lay them before you, God. And we know that you're able to bring healing and strength and restoration to them. Father, we know there are those that are sick emotionally, God. Whatever, Whatever's troubling them, whatever's worrying them, whatever's causing anxiety in them, Lord, we come against those things in the name of Jesus. Lord, we hear chains falling right now. God, we, we know, Lord, that you're able. God, we know you're able to bring freedom and deliverance and healing from those things. Father, we come against those things in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just, we, we know, God, that you're able to heal us spiritually. Lord, we're searching for you. We're longing for you. We're, we're looking for you, God. We're, we're crying out to you, Lord. Your word declares that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Lord, we claim that feeling in Jesus' name. That word righteousness just simply means a right relationship with you. Lord, we, we hunger for that. We long for that. We desire that. We, we thirst for that, God. And we know you're able. And Lord, this morning, God, we just trust you. We put our complete trust in you. Yes. Our faith is in you. Yes. Our strength comes from you. Our joy resides in you. Our peace that passes understanding comes from you and you alone. Lord, we just, we just claim those things. We believe those things. We accept those things from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you bless him with me this morning? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He is a good, good God. And he loves us unconditionally. He loves us with a love that, that can only be described as just this unconditional uh, relational love. He has such great love for you. He knows you by name. He knows your name. He knows where you live. He knows what you woke up to this morning. And He loves you anyway. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you. You can be seated. God bless you. Thank you for entering into worship with us this morning. It, it's now time for us to receive the Lord's tithe and our offering uh, today. And we just uh, encourage you, just be faithful. You can give it now or at some point today before you leave. If you'll just take your, uh, your giving, your offering, your tithe, you can put it in an envelope. There's one in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. Or if you have a check, you can just drop it in one of these boxes on the four columns or around the walls of the sanctuary. And we just thank you in advance for your, for your faithful support of the work of the ministry that goes on here. And Jesus, the Father, said in Malachi, He said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. And then He said, test me in this. Try me in this. Just just." Test me and see if you if you give your tithe, you give 10% of your income. He said, test me in this and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. We know the devourer is the enemy, right? He devours our seed. He eats everything that we plant. He, he destroys us. But sometimes I'm the devourer. Sometimes I eat my own seed instead of giving it to him, letting him bless it and letting him to cause the windows of heaven to be opened toward me, right? So sometimes he's got to rebuke us a little bit. We take that, right? Because it comes from the Lord, right? Absolutely. So thank you in advance for your, for your giving and your support. We love you. Thank you so, so much. Watch this announcement video we have for you. Good morning, church. Here are your weekly announcements. If you're a first-time guest, we'd love the opportunity to get to know you better. There is a Connect card located in the seat back in front of you. If you'd fill it out and take it to the Welcome Center after service, we'd love to meet you. If you're watching service online, you can click the Guest button on our website at hopsfirstassembly.org and fill out the Connect card there. If you're between the ages 18 and 35, we would love for you to be a part of Limitless Young Adults on Thursday nights for Bible study and Sunday nights for hangouts. Hey church, just want to remind you that every Monday from 6 to 8 o'clock, 
we still have our sewing class created by Esther's Beautiful Heart. You still can sign up your child, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, your next door neighbors to come be a part of the class. It's Mondays from 6 to 8 p.m. If you have any questions, please call Frances at her, the phone number listed below. Join us on Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30 for a time of prayer and worship. This is a come and go service, so you may come for 15, 20 minutes, or you may stay the whole time. Men, join our HFA men on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. in the Life Center. Contact or visit with Mario Hernandez for more information. HFA's Connection Membership Class is starting April 11th and going through May 2nd. This is Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. If you are not a member and would like to be a member or would just like to attend these classes, join us again that Sunday morning at 9.30 starting April 11th. If you are a member of HFA and have not attended the Connection Membership class and would like to remain a member, please visit the Information Center and sign a membership card so that we can have a record of your membership. Hey parents, Activate Kids will be going to Unite Kids Camp June 6th through the 9th, ages 7 through 11. For more information, please get in contact with Diana. You may call her at the church office, 492-9497, or you may call her cell phone at 806-433-8086. Hello, HFA ladies. We have our ladies' Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., led by Pilar Ortiz. Please join us as we dive in to a deeper prayer life. That's all your weekly announcements. Now let's prepare our hearts for service. So listen, I, I am convinced that those small groups of fellowship are vitally, vitally important for us. We do good in rows like this, but how many of you know it gets just, just gets so much better when we're in a circle. We do circles better than rows. So small groups, life groups are just vitally, vitally important. So we, we're convinced a men's group for you. Um, they meet on Tuesday nights. Um, so just come and expect the Lord to, to help you, bless you, and grow you. Uh, so, and then our young adults meet on Thursday nights. So uh, that's all good. All right. So let's, let's talk about surviving a storm. We're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 27, uh, in just a few moments. Uh, we're going to read several verses of Scripture there. Paul finds himself uh, in a storm that eventually results in a shipwreck, um, but we're going to talk about how to survive uh, a storm. In 1991, I realize that's a, a sometime before many of you were, were born, but a strong, a storm stronger than any recorded in history hit the coast off of Gloucester, Massachusetts. The storm created an almost apocalyptic situation in the Atlantic Ocean where boats encountered waves of a hundred feet high. That's, that's the equivalent of a 10 story building. I don't know if you've ever been uh, out in the ocean when the waves are, are rough or difficult, but I cannot imagine waves of 100 feet. Uh, winds blew 120 miles an hour. And while this storm may have not been a, a threat to land or uh, to the homes along the shore, it was, however, deadly to those men who were caught in the shipping and fishing Lanes. Uh, many of the families of the small fishing town surrounding Gloucester suffered the loss of friends or family members in what is now remembered as the perfect storm. The perfect storm. Well, we all face storms. Uh, some are physical. Uh, they come in the form of a, of a tornado or a flood or uh, an earthquake, but we all face storms. Some, some are personal. Uh, we face death. Um, we face job problems. We face soured uh, friendship. Storms are a, a part of life. In fact, the right question is not whether they will come or even when uh, they will come, but how do we respond to those storms? 
How do we, how do we respond to them? Because we know they are going to come. Well, we've found a portion of scripture that tells us about how to survive a storm. Let's see what it says. Paul uh, is at a storm, is in a storm at sea. Acts chapter 27, verse 13. Uh, we're going to read several verses of, of scripture there. Verse 13 says this. And when the south wind blew softly, Supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But non, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon. Now, that's, you know, we, we have names for our hurricanes today. You know, they, they used to just be a women's, woman's name, right? Uh, because we couldn't tell where they were going. <laughs> what they were going to do. No. But but now we've started naming them by men's name too because we can't tell what they're going to do or where they're where they're going. Well, they had named this storm Eurachlodon. And so when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clotta, we secured the skiff with difficulty. And when they'd taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and fearing lest they should run aground on the Citrus Island of uh, sand, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, that, that sounds like an old song, doesn't it? We were tempest-tossed. That's just the beauty of the King James Version. And this is the New King James Version. They decided not to change it because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed. The next day, they lightened the ship. And on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. And now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. That just sounds awesome, doesn't it? Of the God to whom I belong and I serve. An angel of the Lord stood with me last night saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. I believe God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that we find so overwhelming and so new to us every day. Lord, I thank you, God, for your word, how you give us direction, how you speak clearly to us, how you, how you make plans for us, Lord. And Father, I just thank you for your grace and mercy in Jesus' name this morning. And everyone said, amen. Thank you. Well, first of all, if we're going to go through a storm, we cannot be guilty of presumption. Don't be guilty of presumption. That's the first thing we got to realize. In verse 13, it said, but when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire to sail, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. Now, if we read a few verses before that, we would understand that Paul, who was a, a prisoner, he was a, a Roman prisoner. He, in fact, he was being taken to Caesar. We find that later revealed uh, in the story, how he was supposed to stand uh, before Caesar. But we would see that Paul told him, look, don't sail. It's a bad time of year. Well, they thought he was just trying to, to get out of being locked in a Roman prison and, and cell and, and dungeon. But, but he was saying, look, don't, don't sail. But they decided they were going to because the soft, the south wind blew softly. And I think that's a picture of us mostly at one time or another 
in our life. Everything looks like smooth sailing. Uh, we have no problems. We have plenty of money in the bank. Our job is secure and everyone is healthy. Uh, like life is good. We have no complaints, no worries, no, no problem. Life is good. And then verse 14 happens. But not long after a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon. These brave sailors were in a storm that seemed to be overwhelming. However, on board the ship was a man by the name of Paul. Every one of us will face storms in life. Every single one of us will, will go through difficulties. Storms don't single out bad people only. They hit good people as well. Earthquakes happen. Tornadoes happen. Uh, floods happen. All of those kind of things happen in our life. And then we talk about the personal storm, the personal issues that we face in life. A death of a loved one. A loss of a job or loss of income or, or, or something happens and something tragic. We, we all face storms in life, but everyone deals with storms, uh, differently. Uh, there were many on the ship who panicked. They, they struggled to know what to do. They, they, they pulled out their, their best, uh, sea storm survival skills. Say that five times real quickly. Uh, sea storm survival skills. Well, well, we all have survival skills that we've learned over the years. We've kind of built them in to our life and to our, our existence, and we'll pull them out when we're, we're facing a storm. There are many on the ship who, who panic, but Paul, I want you to understand this, Paul was settled through the storm. Uh, even though the ship wasn't, he knew because of the Lord had sent an angel to him that they were going to make it, that everybody was going to uh, survive. Listen, people of deep faith have a strength about them in any storm. People of deep faith have a strength about them in any storm. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what's happening. They're just settled in their, in their heart, in their, in their faith towards God. They just, they just know. Perhaps it's that they, they've been through enough storms in life that they know it's all going to work out. That they know ultimately it's going to be for their good and the glory of the Lord. That's what Romans 8, 28 says. Ultimately, we know that and we have it down in our heart, but don't try to quote that to somebody when they've lost a child. Don't try to quote that to somebody when they've lost their job, when they've lost their livelihood. Don't try to quote that scripture to somebody. But listen, if you and I can memorize it and get it down in our heart, when bad things happen, we'll survive. When difficult things come our way, we'll be settled in our faith and we'll know that God is still in control. We got to know that. We got to know that nothing that happens to us will alter the fact that God is still on the throne and he's still working. Paul was a man of faith and he was on a mission. Although he was bound in chains and uh, shackles and we sang this morning about, I hear the chains breaking. Uh, God always works to set us free, but Paul was bound. He was shackled. He was chained. Can you imagine the difficulty he's going to have swimming if that ship goes down? I mean, he's bound, but so he, but he was a, he was settled. He was a, he was a man on a mission. He was in fellowship with God. Listen, you and I don't have to panic when we face storms with confidence because of our relationship with Christ. Because of the hold that he has on our life. Listen to the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter six, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. New, the New Century Version of that verse says, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, sure and strong. Sure and strong. Our hope lies in Jesus and Jesus alone. Let the storms rage. Let the winds howl. Let the rains come. Let the storms of life blow and wreck against us and cause us to think we're going down. But we have this sure anchor of hope. It is in Jesus and Jesus 
alone. So number two, always use precaution when dealing with a storm. In verse 18, it says, and because we were exceedingly tempted tossed the next day, they lightened the ship. Now, these were experienced sailors. Now, no doubt they might have had one or two rookies, but they knew what they needed to do to survive a storm. They'd been in many storms before, no doubt. Their, their captain was a, a man worthy of his salt. He was, he was seaworthy. He had, he had been down the road. He had seen storms. He had survived storms. He had, he had led other men and other ships through storms. Obviously, all those things are true. These men were experienced uh, sailors and they knew what they needed to do. And the first thing they began to do was they got rid of excess baggage. They got rid of excess baggage. Listen, you and I, when we're going through a storm, it's not when the storms come, but it's how we respond. Remember, when you and I go through a storm, the first thing we should do is we should perform a self-examination. We should look at those things that are weighing us down. What do we need to get rid of? Perhaps it's an attitude about someone or, or something. Perhaps you need to forgive someone. Perhaps it's a sin you need to repent of. But get rid of the baggage looking for the Lord to help. Whatever excess baggage is weighing you down. The, the writer of Hebrews said, let us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, that so easily causes us to sink when the storm comes. Let us get rid of those things. They got rid of excess baggage and we should perform a self-examination. We should look deeply in our heart. Is there anything going on in here that I need to deal with, that I need to get rid of, that I need to allow the Lord to clean up of my, of my heart, of my life? That's the first thing we should do. The first place we should look because sometimes storms come uh, not of our own doing, but Literally, sometimes they come because of our own choices, because of the own decisions that we have made, because of the, because of the challenges that we have, we have bought. So we should perform that self-examination and allow the Lord to, to deal with us in a way that gets rid of those things. Sometimes when we repent of something, the storm clears. Sometimes God just miraculously moves and, and the storm is gone. No more are we, are we locked in that. But more times than not, we still got to reap the benefit of things we've sown. We still got to go through the storm. We still got to face the difficulty. We still got to, we still got to deal with those issues in our life because of choices that we made. I can tell you that that's not an easy thing. It's not a, it's not a fun thing, but we want, we want, we want, we want to pray that the Lord will somehow, after we've sown seeds of badness, we want to pray the Lord will cause a failure of the harvest. But we're going to harvest what we've sown. He said, don't grow weary in well-doing. That's the good part. Because you will reap a harvest. That's the bad part. You know, if we're doing well, we're going to reap a harvest. If we're doing bad, we're going to reap a harvest. So we should examine ourselves. Maybe, maybe save yourself some trouble and examine yourself before the storm comes. Okay, I'm going to move on. All right, so number three. Be aware of his presence. In verse 22, he said, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. Paul was not alone. There was an angel of the Lord who came and stood by him. Listen to me, and neither are we alone. Neither are you alone. Jesus said, I'm going to send the comforter. 
so that he can stay with you and remain in you and help you and comfort you and strengthen you through all of those things of life. Paul found that even in the midst of the raging storm, he was not alone. The Lord came to minister to his to his heart and to his life. Listen, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will be with you always. In the King James Version, he said, it's low unto the end of the earth. My pastor used to hate to fly. So he would quote that scripture. The Lord said, low. I will be with you always. So he always drove everywhere he went. He never would fly anywhere because of that. The low. Are you okay? All right. I just thought that was funny. But so, so Jesus, so in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Psalm 23, 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. The Lord's always with us. He's always with you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even if the storm is because of your badness. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always. Dr. Tony Campalo says that when he was a boy growing up in a congested and bustling city, his mother arranged a teenage girl who lived nearby to walk home with him at the end of the day. For this, she was paid a nickel every day. Now that'll tell you how long ago. Uh, that was, but she was given a nickel every day. But Tony rebelled in the second grade and told his mother, I will walk by myself to school, and if you give me a nickel a week, I will be extra careful. You can keep the other 20 cents, and we'll both be better off. After a period of begging and pleading, little Tony finally got his way. And for the next two years, he walked himself back and forth to school. It was an eight-block walk with many streets across, but he was careful and didn't talk to strangers or didn't get distracted along the way. Years later, at a family party, he bragged about his independence and reminded his family how he had taken care of himself as a boy. His mother laughed and added the rest of the story. Did you really think you were alone? Every morning when you left for school, I left with you. I walked behind you all the way. And when you got out of school at 3.30 in the afternoon, I was there. I always kept myself hidden, but I was there and followed you all the way home. I just wanted to be there in case you needed me. Can I tell you, Jesus is walking with you. You may not be able to see him. You may not be able to feel him, but he promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. Storms do not change the plan of God. In verse 24, Paul said, don't be afraid. Or the angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Listen, it was God's plan that Paul would stand in front of Caesar and proclaim the gospel. To Caesar, the most powerful man on the planet. That was going to be Paul's calling. And the storm didn't alter the plan of God. Can you see that? Can you hear that? Can you feel that? Well, Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans for a hope and a future. Doesn't matter. So there was a man years ago who planted a church in Russia. His name was Derek. And um, he flew to Moscow, met with the guy who was in charge of planting churches. And then he rode a train like six hours north of Moscow and finally arrived in his city where he was going to he was going to hold a crusade, preach the gospel, and, and they were going to, um, and then from the people who were saved, uh, he was going to plant a church. And there, there was a pastor there. And there was a man who was coming along to pastor those people that were saved during this crusade. Well, when he got there, they had hung up 
all the banners talking about the crusade of Jesus. And they were all over town, all these banners with his picture on the banners. Well, beneath every banner that they hung up, they, the mafia had come by and hung up their own little banner that said, if you take this guy out, we will pay you 10 grand in Russian money, however much that was, but 10 grand. Well, so when they get there, Derek sees all these banners. And then he asks for the interpretation of the, the banners below his banners. And the guy says, well, the mafia's offered to take you out. Well, what are we going to do? He said, well, we're going to take you to your apartment and we're going to hide you there and we're going to leave you there until it's clear. Well, so he goes to his apartment. They bring him three meals a day, but he's there just praying and begging God, God, what am I going to do? What, what's going to happen? So he, he calls Brother Clendenin, the man who's in charge of planting all these churches. He goes, look, they're going to kill me. They're gonna, they gotta, they've got a hit out on me uh, for preaching the gospel. They're going to they're gonna take my life. He said, what should I do? He said, I was hoping Clendenin would tell me to get on the train and come back to Moscow. But Clendenin just laughed at him and said, son, you're about to have revival. A storm will not change the plans of God. So he prayed that through a few days and he thought, well, how am I going to talk to people back home if I tell them I quit and ran and was afraid and wouldn't plant the church and just went back to Moscow. How am I going to talk to people? How, how am I going to? So finally he got enough courage. He, he called, when the guy brought him in the meal, he said, look, Set up the crusade. I'm going to preach that thing. I don't care if they take me out. I'm going to go down preaching the gospel. So he shows up. There are about 10,000 people that come out to hear him preach the gospel. And when he preaches the gospel, he just asks for a show of hands of how many of you would like to receive Jesus? Every person in the room raised their hand. He thought, well, you, you misunderstood me. He said, so how many of you would like to receive Jesus? Get up, stand up. Every person in the room stood up. He goes, well, you must have misunderstood me. He said, how many of you would like to receive Jesus? Come down here. Everybody in the room came down. 10,000 people gave their heart to the Lord. Listen, God will not change his plans because of the storms that arise to stop you, to get in your way, to, to, to mock. Listen, God's plan. He said, I have a plan for you. I have a dream for you. And whatever that dream is for, from God for you, it will be finished. Paul teaches us to make a choice to believe God. Paul said, I believe God. The angel reminded Paul, say, hey, you're going to stand before Caesar. In Romans chapter 4, verse 21, it says, what he promises, he is able to perform. What has the Lord promised you? What has he spoken into your life? What has he dealt with you about? What has he, what has he, what, what word, what scripture, what rhema word has he given you that, that you can hold on to? Because he's going to perform it. The storm may be a delay, but he's going to perform what he has promised you. The Bible is full of promises. 7,847 promises from God to man, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all over, hold over a thousand promises each. In Psalms 37, pra practically every verse is a wonderful promise from the Lord. Listen, what has he promised you? Hold on to that. Get through that storm because it's going to come to pass. Because he's able to perform. The last thing is, don't get caught pretending. We didn't read this, but in verse 30, it says this. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out acres, anchors from the prow, the sailors were pretending they were going to put out anchors, but actually they were, they was, we're out of here. We're done. They were, they were, they were going to create mutiny on the bounty. 
Anybody remember that old movie? Two of us. It's an old one, I'll guarantee you that. But so they were, they were planning on escape, escaping. They were planning on, listen, there are many people who run away when the storm gets too heavy. They run away when the storm gets too heavy. We run away from the work. We run away from people. We run away from responsibility. We run away from family. We escape to survive, to, to make it through to another day. But, but listen, we cannot get caught pretending. There are many ways to, to run away. We can emotionally shut down. We can just lock off all communication from everybody around us and, and we can emotionally uh, shut down. We can disappear for a time. Uh, we get angry and lash out. You know, there, there, there are all kinds of ways we can, we can respond. We can run away when things become uh, different. I remember there was a guy that I was counseling once who had an anger issue, an anger a problem. And I remember him. I remember his name. I, I'm counseling probably two or three weeks in. And, and um, I'm not really a, a counselor. I can tell you uh, what the Bible says. I can, uh, but, you know, but I'll, I'll help you any way, any way I, I can. So I'm trying to help him with his anger issue. And he really didn't like it when I told him he was running away when he was using his anger. He didn't, he didn't, in fact, he got kind of angry. <laughs> I thought we were going to go to the city right there. I thought we were going to do, I mean, that's how angry the guy got with me. I said, look, all you're doing when you, when you express your anger so loudly and so profoundly, all you're doing is hiding. You're running away. You're, 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 you're causing things to go the way you want them to go out of your anger to keep from having to deal with the issues that your wife is bringing up. He didn't like it. But I just told him, you're running away. Listen, we've got to be people who make a stand regardless. We've got to be men of our word. We cannot say one thing and then do something else. Here, here's the last thing. God's power and protection are ours. In verse 42, it says, and the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape. So, so, you know, that sounds mean and violent and all of those kind of things. But listen, those soldiers were responsible for delivering those prisoners. And if they didn't deliver the prisoners, then they would themselves be executed. That's how harsh the penalty was for them to do what 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 they had been ordered to do. So, so they decided, okay, instead of letting any of them escape, we're just going to kill them all and then we'll present their bodies to, to whoever and, and we'll, and we'll survive that way. We'll, we'll make sure none of them escape. But listen, in verse 43, it says, but the centurion who was over all of the soldiers wanting to save Paul, because he had had an encounter with Paul. And Paul's word that, that not anybody would be lost, only the ship kept him safe. So, so he wanted to save Paul and he kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship, and so it was that they all escaped safely to land. They all escaped safely to land. Paul's words came true. The ship was lost, but everyone on the ship was saved. In Psalms 77, the psalmist is, is 
crying out. This is not David who wrote this. This is a man by the name of Asaph who wrote several of the, probably the second leading psalm writer in the genre of psalms. Um, he's relating a very personal experience in this, in this psalm. And he said, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice. Uh, he's, he's saying, look, Anytime they repeat anything in Hebrew culture, it's like they didn't have exclamation points. You know, when we when we say something and we want to emphasize it emphatically, we want to emphasize it, we'll we'll follow it up with an exclamation point. And that means hey, I'm meaning what I say. Well, they didn't have exclamation points, so they would repeat it to draw attention to it. He said, I cried out to God with my voice to God. With my boys, I'm praying. I'm asking God. I'm seeking the Lord. I, I'm crying out to him. And he gave ear to me, me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. And my hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My, my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. And then that phrase, Selah, which means think about that. That's what he's saying there. Pause a moment. I cried out to God with my voice. My soul was troubled. Even in the nighttime, in the middle of the night, without ceasing, my, my soul refused to be comforted. And then in verse 4, he said, you hold my eyelids open. He's blaming the Lord. I, look, I am so troubled, I can't sleep. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart. and My spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed evermore? Has God Forgotten to be gracious, has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Think about that, he said. Has God forsaken me? Has God relinquished on his promise to me that he'd always be with me, that he'd never leave me? Verse 10, he says, and this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. So here's what he's doing. I can't find God. I can't hear Him. I can't see Him. I can't, I can't feel Him. I've spent the night crying out to Him. I've cried to Him with my voice. I've, I've shouted to Him. Uh, has He relinquished? Has He given up? Has He forsaken me? Has He left me? And then He goes, but I'm going to remember His works from before. Listen, one of the best things you can do when you can't find God is remember what He's done for you before. Remember His works. Remember His faithfulness. Remember his ability to work in your life. Remember what he's done for you in the past. Think back. Relive it. Redo it. Re refocus on it. And in verse 14, he says, You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Think about that. He goes, so he's remembered back. He remembers the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob. Uh, he remembers the God of Isaac. He, he just remembers God's faithfulness. He remembers God delivering them through the Red Sea and the, and the 40 years in the wilderness. He remembers God giving them the promised land. He remembers all of those things. And he goes, you are the God who does wonders. Just think back. What has God done for you? How has he saved you? How has he redeemed you? How has he changed your life? How has he helped you? Verse 16, the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and they were afraid. 
the depths also trembled. Listen, he's talking about the Red Sea experience. The, the waters rolled back as God led the children of Israel across. I don't know how many children of Israel there were. Some say two million, some say four million. The numbers vary. But listen, for them to cross the Red Sea in one night, one night they crossed the Red Sea. For them to cross all on dry ground, by the way, not muddy, not troubled, not difficult, it's dry ground. But for that many people to cross the Red Sea in one night, they had to cross 5,000 abreast. 5,000 people wide. Think about that. God just didn't roll the waters back like it looked like in the Ten Commandments where a few could get across at a time. He rolled them back. That 5,000 people could walk across on dry ground at one time. I'm going to tell you something. The God who does wonders is still at work today. He will help you through any storm. He will cause the waters to divide. He will cause the wind to cease. He will cause the storm to stop raging. But, but even if he does it, he'll make sure you get to the other side. That's the God we serve. That's the God of miracles. That's the God of wonders. His wonders, he still performs today. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your goodness toward us. Thank you, God, that you help us through the storm. Thank you, Father, for helping us through the storms that we cause for helping us through the storms that blow indiscriminately against us. Lord, when they come, we know you're with us always and you're going to walk with us and you promise to never leave us nor forsake us. Father, I rejoice in your wonders, in your goodness. As we look back over the past, the things that you've done for us, oh my, oh my Lord. There is no one worthy to be compared to you. Your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Father, I know that there are men and women in this room who are under the sound of my voice that are facing storms of life. Lord, I pray you comfort them. I pray you strengthen them. I pray you show yourself alongside them. God, even if you choose not to, help us to know your word declares you will always be with us. You're always walking alongside us. Lord, you're always, you're always following us, sometimes hidden in the shadows, but Lord, you're always there. And we rejoice. And we thank you in Jesus' name. I wonder if you'd stand with me this morning. Let's go to the Lord and worship this morning. Because you said it, I see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus' name. Oh, all darkness defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God, oh no. There's nothing stopping you, cause you said it, I see it. You still do miracles, there's power in Jesus' name, oh. All darkness defeated, there's nothing stopping you, my God. Oh, there's nothing stopping you, my God. 
Here's what I want to do. I want to I want to just challenge you for a few moments this morning. Maybe you're going through a storm in life. Maybe you're facing issues that you've never faced before. Maybe you're maybe you're dealing with something I don't know. But listen, the Lord is here. And he wants to remind you of his goodness toward you. And he wants to help you. He wants to be there for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to invite you to come, whether you're going through a storm or not. Maybe you're going to face a storm someday, but let's just come ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to deal with this? How do you want me to, how do you want me to make it through? So I'm going to open the altars to you. And I'm going to invite you to come. Stand down here. Kneel down here. Just come. Talk to the Father for a few moments. Just wrestle through that situation that you're facing in life. And let the Spirit of the Lord help you. Let Him deal with you. I know, I know. listen, I know there are people here thinking, I'm not going down there. What will people think? They're going to be coming anyway. And those, those who think things, doesn't matter what they think, right? All that matters is what's between me and the Lord, between you and the Lord. So you may be facing the storm. You may not. You may just think, okay, I'm going to go just talk to the Lord. What's he saying to me about this situation? So come, just come, just come. Find your place to be alone with him. Just talk to him. You may just want to move up a few, a few pews. I don't know, but just I think something happens when we take a step towards God. He'll take a step towards us. So come on, just come. Talk to the Father. Let him talk to you. Do what only you can do. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Because you can make the chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Do what only you can do. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Cause you can make the chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Cause even the impossible is possible for you. Cause you said it, I see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus' name. Oh, all darkness defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. Because you said it. I see it, you still do miracles, there's power in Jesus' name, oh, all darkness defeated, there's nothing stopping you, my God, oh no. There's nothing stopping you, my God, no. There's nothing stopping you, our God. Oh, there's nothing stopping you, our God, no. There's nothing stopping you, our God, oh, no. Oh, there's nothing that can stop you, oh, no. 
Just do what only you can do. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. You can make the chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. My my pastor used to wear a three-piece suit every time he'd preach. He always wore a clip-on tie because he thought those tie ties would steal your victory on Sunday morning trying to get that sucker tied right. So he always wore a clip-on tie. I got, I'm going somewhere with this, so just, just listen to me. So he'd start preaching, and man, he would he'd preach the paint off a wall. I kid you not, he'd preach like, like nobody's business. And pretty soon that jacket would come off. And, and I mean, he's just preaching along there. And pretty soon he'd start unbuttoning that vest and that vest would come off. He'd fold it very neatly and put it on the chair on the platform. And pretty soon, when, I'm in telling you, if you ever got to unclipping that tie, you knew we were going to be there for a while. He'd unclip that tie and he'd unbutton that top button. And man, he would preach We'd shout, we'd, we'd, you know. Well, then when he's winding down, you button that button back up, flip that tie back on, put that vest back on, button every button, get his jacket, put that jacket. I mean, he's completely fully dressed when he's done. I was thinking about that, that man this week. I was just so grateful for the truth that He bestowed in my life. Every day I got to hear Him preach. Every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, He just, He preached the Word of God. I'm so grateful, so thankful, so appreciative of all that He had done and spoken into my life. Can I tell you something? We need to, for you, you've got somebody like that. You've got somebody in your history, in your past, who preached the word to you. Can I just tell you something? Tell them thank you before it's too late. Tell them how much you love them, how much you appreciate them, how much you you honor them. He went to be with the Lord and made heaven that much sweeter for me. I'm going to tell you, I just appreciate his value. All those things he just shared and spoken in my life. If you've got somebody like that, tell them before it's too late, all right? Just call them on the phone. Might have been a mama who prayed for you. Might have been a daddy who taught you those things that were tough and difficult and hard, but he disciplined you with the love of the Lord. And Call him. Tell him. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I appreciate you, every one of you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for hearing the word of the Lord. Thank you for responding. I'm just trusting Jesus. Going to get you through whatever storm you're facing. Amen. He has that ability. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Shake hands. Be friendly. Hug somebody's neck. Thank you guys for joining us for this week's service. If you asked Jesus to come into your heart or you rededicated your life, we want to know about it. So stay connected with us on our website. You'll see it below the screen. You'll go to connect. You'll go to prayer request, whatever it is that you need. We want to stay connected with you. Fill out the connect card with all your information. We promise not to blow up your, your email with a junk mail or anything like that or call you or send you out mass text. We just want to know your information in case you need us. Um, We are here for you. So we can't wait to see you guys next week. Please join us.